what Americans don't understand is that we we see you. We see the lack of diversity within your own institutions. We see the lack of diversity within your own companies. And we see the, the racial reckoning that you are having right now. And this expectation that you will come and you will lecture us about equalities, about freedoms when your house is not in order. And, yeah. and the fact that your house is not in order is part of the reason why you, you don't see all the opportunities in Africa. So if there were more people in the State Department Foreign Service that looked like the ambassador or more people in the blue chip companies that looked like us, they would be able to understand. So you, you know, just this issue of corruption, being, a, being an African, being from Sudan, I know how systems work. So in our previous dictatorship, if there had been a direct government to government treaty around increasing investment from American companies, and part of that deal is that there would be no kickbacks for anyone along that line, people would die if there were kickbacks. It is just about political will and understanding the systems that you work in. Good evening. I'm sorry for the temporary delay. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're safe and you're sound. I'm Aaron David Miller, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and welcome to our 10th session of Carnegie Connects, a series of virtual conversations about issues of critical importance to America and to the world. And I wanna welcome everyone warmly today to uh, a very special discussion on the US and Africa perceptions and policies. I'm really excited about today's program, largely because of our distinguished panel, who I will introduce in a minute, but also because this day marks a new departure for Carnegie. This panel is not going to be a one-off, but the beginning of Carnegie's sustained focus long overdue on Africa and its changing role in a changing international landscape. In the fall, Carnegie will launch a new Africa program. We've of course done work on Africa over many years and across a number of our programs, but we're thrilled now for the first time to have a standalone program whose aim will be to help decision makers around the world understand the continent as a dynamic geopolitical player uh, that it has become and the need to update outdated policy theories and approaches. So stay tuned for that exciting announcement. And I hope very much that all of you will engage with us and contribute to, uh, to our work. For me personally, this is also something of a new experience. My career in Middle East diplomacy has taken me many times to Egypt and North Africa, and I've had occasion to visit South Africa, but I've had little exposure to the complexity and diversity of the African continent. And in a sense, as an American, I suspect I'm not alone. In preparing for this session, I was acutely and painfully reminded of how much I really didn't know. And I liken studying Africa to the way I uh, approach the Middle East a university from one which never graduates uh, or gets a diploma. It's so vast, so complex, so much to understand. So I have many more questions today than answers. How do we conceptualize and frame the very idea of Africa, a continent with more than 50 countries, each with its own unique structure and yet tethered to the idea of a broader sense of African identity, sharing many common challenges and opportunities. And then there's the sheer vastness of the continent itself. You can fit the US and China into this space and still have room to spare. The distance I was told between London and Moscow is the distance between the mouth of the Congo River and its Eastern border that was Sudan. I also discovered an Africa is not a country app which measures how many articles and journalists use the word Africa instead of referring to a specific country or set of countries. And it highlights the problem, I think, of seeing Africa as a single unit, a generalization, a stereotype that often obscures its complexity and diversity. Um, a Nigerian novelist with whom I became familiar warned of this challenge calling it the danger of the single story, a story which can often create stereotypes and makes one story the only story. And from there, of course, many other questions. How to frame US policy, what priorities the United States should attach to Africa, 
And finally, one of the things I'm most intrigued about is what do we get wrong about Africa, about such a complex mosaic? And what, if anything, have we uh, learned over the years? Uh, many other questions, but fortunately, we have three brilliant panelists uh, who are going to answer them. But we're honored, truly, to have Ellen Johnson Sirleaf here, who is known to you all. She is a Liberian politician who served as the 24th president of Liberia from 2006 to 2018. She was the first elected female head of state in Africa and won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 in recognition of her efforts to bring women into the peacekeeping process. She's won numerous awards and now heads a foundation, the Center for Women and Development. And I hope, Madam President, before the hour is done, you could say a word or two about, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, please correct me if I'm not, the Mujahi Initiative, uh, this apparently derived from a Liberian language crew, meaning we are all going up together. Uh, and that initiative addresses the underrepresentation of women in, uh, in public life uh, in Africa. We're also pleased and honored to have Ambassador Linda Thomas Greenfield, who is a senior vice president at the Albright Stonebridge Group and leads the firm's Africa practice. From 2013 to 2017, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield served as the a US Secretary of State for African Affairs, where she led the development and management of US policy towards Sub-Saharan Africa, with a focus on economic empowerment, investment, peace and security, and democracy and governance. Prior to that, uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield served as the Director General of the State Department's Foreign Service and Director of Human Resources. She's served as um, Ambassador to Liberia. She's had posting at the U.S. Mission to the U.N. in Switzerland, as well as Kenya, Nigeria, the Kenya, Pakistan, and Jamaica. And finally, we are very honored to have with us today uh, Nama El Bagheera is an award-winning senior international correspondent journalist for CNN based in London. She was named the 2020 Royal Television Society TV Journalist of the Year and recently received the prestigious 2019 Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award. She's won numerous awards throughout her career, including the George Polk Award. She's been recognized internationally for her investigative reporting covering not only major human rights violations, but the West African Ebola crisis in 2014 and other prominent uh, stories related to extremism, women and girls, security, famine uh, uh, across much of the entire confident continent of Africa. The format is quite simple, five minutes each of opening remarks, a moderated round of discussion, and then to your Q&A. So, uh, Madam President, may I turn the virtual floor over to you. Uh, thank you. Let me start with a thanks to you, Aaron, and to the Carnegie team for organizing this event. And see how pleased it is to be with, uh, with Linda and Nana. Uh, wait, I also want to, to see how we are this welcome initiative about Carnegie having this sustained focus on Africa uh, and having a particular Africa program uh, that tells us that um, the future will have some changes as as being called for right now. Um, uh, Pre-COVID-19, uh, you know, Africa was seen as the the rising continent, the youngest continent, um, great uh, democratic dividends, uh, that uh, our transformation was well underway, uh, guided by Africa 2063, our goals towards sustainable development goals. And, and I made quite some progress, we think, in terms of, of growth. 3.2% uh, average annual uh, continental, four of the 10 
highest uh, uh, highest growth countries uh, in Africa. Uh, we worked a long way to get our African Continental Free Trade Agreement going. That's going to to be uh, the instrument for ensuring regional cooperation and, and integration. And I think uh, we all have talked about, you know, African Development Bank and the the priorities we've set for infrastructure, agriculture, energy, private sector, governance and accountability. So, um, and lots of, there are lots of things that show for that uh, technological revolution. I mean, who would have thought that today you have 230 billion smartphones uh, in Africa and that 400 billion having access uh, to broadband and, and technology. Uh, this is all spearheaded by a young, creative and innovative uh, group of African right across the continent, uh, bringing uh, transactions through money transfers, the M-Pesa in Kenya and all that has revolutionized uh, the way things are done. Uh, yeah, we also applaud ourselves, we say, for what we've done for promoting democracy and an open society. Uh, so many of our countries now having regular uh, peaceful transfer of power. Many haven't done this two or three times so that we see political maturity beginning to set in. Uh, and, and, and women, I mean, we haven't yet... Uh, uh, we, we've broken the glass ceilings, but uh, it, can, it can shut very quickly, can't it? Uh, or, or try to reconsult it itself. <laughs> uh, but we, in Parliament, we've done very well. I mean, one of our countries, Rwanda, having the highest parliamentarian representation, women representation in the world. And so many others have been, uh, reached 50% or more. But that's, you know, that's all a good news story. But we have some we have challenges too, serious challenges like terrorism, uh, something that has now penetrated so many of our countries, uh, particularly in West Africa, and the effects that this has had on the on the progress on all they've been doing uh, for their transformation. Uh, also, because our population is so young, uh, we have a job problem. I mean, it's been good education for many of our young many of them now are educated but unemployed uh, because their numbers are large and we haven't been able to have the transformation in in um, industry that will create jobs uh, being able to make sure that uh, our natural resources have value addition that will create those factories and whatnot there's progress nevertheless but those are real challenges that remain in food insecurity because too long we have done uh, too much of uh, importation of food. But in the midst of all of this, we have COVID. And, and COVID is really having a devastating effect, uh, first and foremost in human lives, um, economic growth, political momentum, social in inequality. Um, and we also find that uh, because of the interconnected nature of global risk, the extent to which well-resourced health systems have been rapidly overwhelmed when this crisis hit, tells us that the ability to respond to many of the poor nations with weaker health system, you know, uh, have, they have been... Uh, been declining have there been the response has not been there uh, and it comes at a time too when um, you find multilateral systems are under attack those that are supposed to have the vehicles for for being able to do the connection uh, between the, the countries with greater capacities to respond to health crisis and those who haven't uh, the effect on our growth and uh, supply chain uh, disruption, what is done to production decline, uh, our debt issue, I think that's been played out very well. And the, the effects of the lockdown, I must say in, 
you know, Africa has about what? The, the latest I saw, the total confirmed cases are about 179,000. Uh, but then deaths have been relatively low. And we, what that says to us that um, the experience we learned from Ebola, uh, the fact that our countries did lockdown right quickly and, and put, their, put their technicians and the health uh, uh, experts in charge of it and had the best uh, correspondence, the best, the best information to the public uh, is changing because the effect of other countries more developed now beginning to open uh, means that um, uh, our countries too are beginning to open. Uh, the effect of that again, the effect of that of the lockdown has been severe. Also, the loss of jobs because people have not uh, been going about their daily their daily activities. And you know, most of our we have our informal sector. We have our population that live in congested neighborhoods where they cannot do the kind of social distancing uh, that's required to contain uh, the transmission. Uh, the fact that schools are closed and kids won't go to school. And in our rural, in our rural uh, areas, they have the kinds of technology for those that will do distance learning, you know. Um, and so we have all these, these uh, complications as a result of the effect of, of, of COVID. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what the, the response? Well, um, I think uh, we, there's been a lot of appeal on the part of the situation in Africa at a time when, um, you know, the global conditions are so, so complex uh, that the, the response we were looking for um, a slow incoming uh, stimulus. Uh, countries have tried based upon natural uh, revenues and natural resources to apply stimulus to do cash transfers to poor families. Uh, but that has not been sufficient because of the resource scarcity. And so we, there's a lot of um, discussion going on with uh, the G20 trying to ensure that the, the situation of debt and the amount that African countries would have to pay um, for interest on debt, how do we make sure that uh, we can get a relief in two years of suspended uh, debt service payments, uh, giving us a time to, to recover and get the economy functioning again, uh, our healthcare systems and uh, special attention to, you know, to matters relating to fragile states, which are the most vulnerable. Uh, these are discussions of today in Africa. Yeah. And these are the dialogue that are ongoing, first within the continent itself, uh, through our regional institution, through the African Union, uh, our own responses through the Economic Commission for Africa, working with our ministers of finance to be able to respond and to work with the G20. And many of us have collaborated with other international bodies in, in the appeal and examining it. So, so where are we? Um, Africa, of course, uh, has not developed uh, the kinds of of a national response capability. We've not, we were not, despite Ebola, there was no vaccine. Of course, that process started in Ebola, and now we see because of COVID-19, there's a lot, so the issue is going to come. Will it be made available to all? Or will it be subject to negotiation, to, to purchasing, to competition and where would that leaves us are we going to need make africa once again is left behind as a result of this uh, some of the issues um we we believe that right now there's a big demand for change as a call for action 
uh, to be able to address the inequalities and injustices uh, that have characterized international relationship for too long. Um, we, you know, when certain issues relating to uh, to Africa's own relationship with with the United States, I'm sure uh, things that don't come up uh, in some of the discussion that we follow. Uh, so at, at this stage, I, I say that Africa is positioned uh, to be a part of the new world order and, and to make its contribution and to, and to stand firm looking for better partnerships, uh, not being dependent, but using its own natural resources for its own self-sufficiency in a partnership that brings mutual benefits to, to all partners, Africa, uh, the United States, first of all, since this is the subject of our discussion, but all the other countries with which that's a, that's a wonderful, those are wonderful questions. That's a, I couldn't ask for a better scene setter and an, and an overview, Madam President. Thank you so much. Uh, let me now turn to um, Madam Ambassador, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, Madam President. First, let me uh, start by commending Carnegie for hosting uh, this uh, discussion. I was delighted when I was asked uh, to join this discussion, and I didn't know at the at the time that uh, Aaron would be announcing that this would be the first of many programs that Carnegie will be hosting on, on Africa as it launches its new Africa program. So I'm excited about the Africa program. I think it reaffirms for all of us uh, the important role of the African continent uh, as uh, we move forward in, in, uh, in this century. And second, I, I'm truly honored to participate in the program with uh, uh, President Sirleaf. Uh, she is a respected voice and an important leader on, on the continent. And uh, she, uh, I agree with you, Erin, set the stage. Uh, having served as the ambassador to Liberia, I got to see her skillful leadership uh, in, in action. And Nema, it's really wonderful to meet you on, on this forum. You're a legend on the continent of, of Africa. We've seen your many uh, exciting reports that you've done focused on women, focused on, on issues that, that are important. Uh, I've been asked to speak briefly on U.S. and Africa policy, and let me start. I'm going to do something that will surprise you. I'm going to remind myself, as you've already heard, that Africa is not a country. Uh, it's not even a region, and we all make that, uh, that mistake, even me. I've been in and out of Africa and studying Africa uh, for most of my uh, adult life, and I make that mistake, even as the Assistant Secretary of Africa. Our policies toward Africa tend uh, to focus on the continent and not on individual countries. We look at the commonalities uh, across these 54 countries and the policies uh, are, tend to be regional and rarely, rarely bilateral. Also, when uh, we refer to US policy toward Africa, we focus broadly on, on an approach uh, historically uh, that, has, uh, that has been uh, uh, what we refer to in the United States as, as bipartisan. Um, and so I will try to uh, uh, describe broadly our, historically our, our relationship with Africa, where we are today and where we should be in the future. And I'm gonna try to do that in less than five minutes. Uh, so you can imagine this is going to be very top line, very general. So don't criticize me for being general, but I hope that when we get into our discussions, uh, we will have a much uh, richer and detailed uh, conversation. Uh, let me start out by saying that Africa matters. Uh, it matters to the U.S. and it matters to the world. I said this in the last speech that I uh, delivered when I uh, departed my position as Assistant Secretary for Africa in 2017. And I stress it again today, but you may ask why should Africa matter to, to the United States? I think uh, uh, President Sirleaf gave you some ideas uh, as she talked about uh, the role that Africa plays 
and while Africa is made up of 54 countries, um, there are some commonalities that describe why Africa should, uh, should matter and be taken into account by US policymakers. First, I, I would mention with 54 countries, Africa is rich in natural resources, and these resources are key to US interests. From oil to minerals, agricultural lands and fisheries, there are untapped resources that are important to the well-being of the people of Africa and the countries uh, in Africa, um, as well as to countries like the United States. Uh, let me clearly say the continent is not poor. People are poor, but the continent is extraordinarily rich. And I think that's the first thing to take into account. Second, the continent is young. Uh, the medium age in Africa is 19.7. I just saw that Niger and Chad are down to 14. I used to say 15. It's actually gone down to 14. Uh, we have to take into account the youth of this continent. We must harness and address the generational issues so that young people become truly transformational leaders uh, in the future and that they use their leadership skills for good. Uh, third, Africa is extraordinarily urban. Most people assume that Africans live in village, villages doing subsistence farming, and that is the farthest thing from, from the truth. We must figure out how to address the, address the issues in our policy of rapid urbanization on the continent and how to make uh, the, the presence of large populations in urban areas uh, uh, work for, for countries. For population. Africa is the most populous, the second most populous country, uh, continent, country. Uh, I had to remind myself, uh, the second most populous continent in the world. Current population is somewhere around 1.3 billion. It's 16% of the world. It's expected to more than double by 2050 to about 39% of, of the world population. So again, policies have to look at these population issues which might impact migration, uh, it's going to impact stability on, on the continent. And five, we must recognize Africa's strategic value as it relates to climate change, as it relates to democracy and other, other global issues. And the president touched on those when she talked about uh, the impact of, uh, of health. For these reasons, as well as I know this list could be unlimited, I, I usually work on the rule of five, um, but for these reasons, you, uh, the continent of Africa should be a key foreign policy priority for the United States. Uh, it should be a priority uh, broadly for the current ad administration, as well as the next administration, uh, whoever that might be. How these factors play into U.S. policy and in interests in Africa, I think, will be a, a question that everyone will be asking. Uh, historically and across administrations, Africa policy, uh, as I mentioned, has been bipartisan, but it's also been initiative driven. Uh, you all can recite all of the initiatives that we have had uh, across the African continent. You rarely see that anyplace else in the world. Our policies have been prescriptive. We tell Africans what we think they, uh, they should look like, what they should be doing, what they should focus on, and what their priorities should be. Our policies have also been resource extractive. So we've taken but not given back much in terms of building the economies of, of Africa. Our policies have occasionally but not always um, uh, taken into account these five factors that I outlined. And we are generally identified our interests in Africa as it relates to other foreign policy priorities. We're during the Cold War, we were competing with Russia. Uh, today, it's uh, China's uh, mercantilist uh, and aggressive trade approach to, to Africa. And we see, in fact, uh, we, I, I remember when the uh, Trump administration announced its Africa policy uh, uh, delivered by uh, then National Security Advisor Bolton, uh, everyone referred to it as the China policy. Our policy is very related to what our priorities are, are uh, elsewhere. Uh, both parties have generally supported administration policies that 
uh, focused on a perception of the continent uh, that was impoverished, a continent that was in conflict, a continent to be pitted and one in which we could extract from uh, either in terms of natural resources or more in specifically in terms of influence. And I don't want to diminish the positive impact of programs and initiatives, the Malaria Initiative, PEPFAR, our poverty reduction programs, maternal and child mortality programs, Feed the Future and, and, and other programs, just uh, to name a few. All of these initiatives had impact. They saved lives. They changed lives but they did not deal with the long-term underlying causes of uh, problems in Africa uh, that have led to governments not being able to address these problems in a long-term way. Uh, the Obama administration, of which I was a part, I was also part of the Bush administration with PEPFAR and, and those programs, uh, ramped up our relations with the continent uh, with programs like YALI, uh, uh, and fortunately, YALI was maintained by the current administration. It focused on harnessing the power of, of youth, the power of the next generation. It recognized the, the uh, youngness of the African continent. And I think we will see benefits from the YALI program for many, many years as these young people take uh, the leadership skills and the, um, the capacity that they have been provided and moved into their next level of leadership in their countries. Uh, the Obama administration hosted the first Africa Leaders Summit, which brought all of the continent's leaders to Washington to meet with administration officials to discuss how future cooperation and partnership with Africa could move forward uh, in a more positive way. Uh, these and other programs, I, I believe, built strong relationships with the countries of the continent but over the past three years, I, I have to uh, say I've observed that relations have stalled during this administration, and I'm being kind by saying stalled. Uh, we have continued with many of the programs that were started by previous administrations, such as YALI and, and AGOA and PEPFAR and the Malaria Initiative, uh, and I commend the administration for that. Uh, but we have not seen the administration move the needle significantly. Uh, we've not taken our relations, uh, relationships with countries in Africa to a higher level. Uh, when I have spoken to leaders and spoken to people across the continent, they feel ignored. Uh, they feel disrespected. Uh, the president's referring to some countries as SO countries was kind of a dash of cold water for African leaders who actually look at uh, a new Republican administration uh, one in which they could work with and one which would ramp up uh, relationships leader to leader. Uh, so they were very dis disappointed. The travel ban on Muslim countries with a significant mm -hmm. share of African countries on that list also uh, was disappointing. Immigration bans have not helped also to improve relations. The administration has made some efforts to ramp up trade relations and are uh, involved in ongoing discussions with the government of Kenya uh, for a bilateral trade agreement, but that has come very late in the administration uh, and it's come at a time when Africa is actually in the process of, of uh, form it, uh, forming the continental free trade area, which will actually, in my view, over the long term, empower Africa uh, in terms of its trade relationships across the globe. The administration policy on Africa has also tended to focus on China, as I mentioned uh, earlier which leaves a bad taste in the mouth of most uh, African leaders uh, as we have offered them no alternatives to what Africans see themselves gaining uh, from a relationship uh, with China. So hopefully a new and different administration will come to understand the importance of China as it relates to our key priorities, including dealing with terrorism, climate change, trafficking. Our future relationship with the continent must recognize the importance of partnering with countries galvanize their resources to benefit the people of, of, these, uh, of the 54 countries. We must look at the continent uh, as a whole, particularly as it relates to the Africa continental free trade area, as that is realized because we have to determine, uh, but we also have to determine from a bilateral perspective, which countries on the continent uh, have priority for us which countries we see uh, we have mutual, uh, we can mutually benefit uh, in terms of a relationship. 
we must also recognize Africa's priorities for themselves and accept that they may not be the same as ours. We have to hear what is on their mind or we tell them what's on our minds. We have to recognize the power of and the importance of the Africa diaspora here in the United States as an avenue for stronger relationships with particular countries on the continent. The Africa di diaspora in the United States is an extraordinary uh, tool uh, that the United States has that no other region of, of the world uh, has. And then finally, let me say what I started with. Africa does matter and it should not be an afterthought. Um, uh, it should not be an afterthought in, in our foreign policy. So I will end there. I look forward to your questions and hopefully a much deeper conversation than the broad generalizations that made here today. Thank you. Thank you. They may have been broad generalizations, but you should definitely write that up because I think that's an extraordinary, excellent summary, certainly for me, uh, of the challenges, the opportunities, and the disconnects, and it's actually some of the coherence uh, in U.S. policy. But we'll return to some of these themes in the Q&A. Well, I guess it's time, Nima, to turn to you. Um, and uh, thanks again for participating. Um, the floor is oh, yours. Thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it is such an honor. and I'm slightly trepidous to follow after Madam President and the, and the Ambassador's fantastic summations. I wanted to actually look a little, little bit more at the perceptions from both sides. Um, and I, I think the Ambassador really hit hit the kind of the nub of the issue when she spoke about the relationship between the U.S. and Africa in general, African countries in general, as being po both prescriptive and extractive. I think I would go a little bit further and say it often has also been infantilizing. And in a way, is as much a reflection of, of what is happening internally in the U.S., the social upheavals and the historic waves that we see the U.S. going through, as it it is a reflection of the way that the U.S. is genuinely viewing Africa. So I don't think it is in any way a coincidence that it was a Republican president who was very much um, at the heart of, uh, of, of the, the Christian right-wing evangelical establishment who contributed the most to Africa because it was very much within that accepted context of Africans as needing saving both from famine, from AIDS, through PEPFA, but also from their heathen waves. So... So he also unleashed this wave of missionaries that Africa, that East Africa especially, Uganda has suffered from hugely to this day. And then, but at the same time, it was under George Bush that we saw a goer and we saw this huge spike in trade. I think it was up to something like a hundred billion. And it was during President Obama and, and with all fairness, there was no way that President Obama could have met the expectations of the continent. Uh, he could barely meet, uh, similarly, he, there was no way he could meet the expectations of the African American community at home. And I think you see that duality and that mirror again. But it's still, given all of that, President Obama, in all of his foreign policy, was very much, um, I think, generously, you could say, he, he tended to tread carefully less generously he consistently prioritized the domestic wins like the affordable care act over really see really pushing back on you know the serious Syrian chemical weapons red line and we saw that happening with africa and and also at the same time the domestic energy uh, industry spiked in america so just the needs weren't there and we are now at a place where trade between the us and africa is at its lowest so the question i would actually put to the panel and to the people watching is why Africa need the United States? That's a genuine question. You know, what, what Africa, many African officials and many young Africans that I spoke to both in East Africa and West Africa, in Liberia, um, in South Africa, what they were saying when President Trump was elected was, first of all, hey, sometimes we think parts of Africa aren't that great. So while the, you know, while the the slur was was deeply problematic on so many levels and i personally was enraged by it a lot of young africans were saying to me okay but we hear lots of lovely floral language what are they actually bringing to the table and perhaps with this president who claims to be a deal maker and and actually in many ways is is, is much closer to some of the big men that we grew up with post-independence leadership in 
Africa. Perhaps he may actually treat us the same way that Russia and China do, which is this is a transactional relationship. We are not here to lecture you. And actually, I covered President Obama's last visit to Africa. I was there in Kenya. And one of the many complaints people had was, why is he lecturing us? Why does he think he gets to lecture us? Because at the end of the day, he is still an American president. He's not our president. And so I think it's, it's always about these perceptions and where America is in its own social lifespan, in, in its own evolution. And now we are at a point when Africa, inshallah, Allah, fingers crossed, post-pandemic, hopefully will continue in that resurgence. It is, we don't know where the wave is, and the wave is much further along in terms of when it will hit Africa at, at its hardest. And we have both, I mean, Madam President spoke so well about the lessons that have been learned from Ebola and the lessons that haven't been learned from Ebola. And one of those is the ways which the health system has not been effectively reconstituted in many countries around the continent. But one of the extraordinary lessons lessons we've learned is innovation. Rwanda, Ghana, the use of drones to take tests to these rural communities, the understanding that this is, we've seen what these kind of viruses can do because we saw what Ebola did. And people in Africa often take it much seriously than I think some of these kids in Florida are taking this pandemic, or some of the kids on the beach in Brighton here in the UK on sunny weekends. But I do think often what is lost in this conversation about Africa versus the United States is that Africa is now in this position, as all of you have, have so well laid out, seven of the 20 fastest growing economies of the world, potentially one of the largest markets when this transcontinental uh, treaty comes together for one African market. That, and that, there's been a lot of Chinese soft power in invested in that coming together. I highly doubt that China will step out of the way and say to the US or Russia or anyone, here, we help put this together, please take this away. The question America and American policymakers need to be asking themselves for the first time in this relationship is, how do we woo Africa? Our goods are too expensive for many African markets compared to Chinese and, and, and Korean and, and other Asian markets, India, you know, Tata's taking over most of the continent. Um, Apple, you know what, Huawei and a lot of these other cheaper phones and even old Nokias are finding, uh, you know, a much bigger lifespan and, and have their own cultural cachet in Africa compared to Apple. The cultural conversation is now being had about Africa. You have Bernaboy, you have all these extraordinary, I was just listening on Spotify to a Sudanese trap artist. Netflix is making money past its competitors because it went international before everyone else. And pre-pandemic, Netflix didn't care that it was losing subscribers in North America and in Europe because it was gaining numbers in Africa. So I really think the questions that policymakers in the US need to ask themselves is how do we make ourselves attractive to Africa? Because this game has changed hugely and it's not just China, it's not just Russia, it's Thailand, it's Turkey, it's Indonesia, it's countries that are actually having a relationship of equals and don't have the baggage. You know, often when we talk about European relationships, French relationships, especially with African countries, we talk about that colonial baggage. And, and, and often the US doesn't think of itself in this way because it thinks of itself as having a tabula rasa, but it brings so much baggage to this relationship. And, and it, I think a lot of African leaders, Madam President, you know better, and definitely the ambassador knows better than I do, but a lot of African leaders are kind of sitting back and going, you know what, take me for dinner, make me feel pretty. It's now our turn to be wooed. <laughs> Well, I have to say, it was highly stimulating, and it turns on its head, frankly, the, the traditional and conventional American approach to just about everything. I mean, it's, it's the antithesis of American exceptionalism. It's the antithesis of America, the indispensable power, as if somehow the world is simply waiting for American leadership. Now, that may be true, particularly with respect to the last three years, but the question you pose them is, is I, I think, a fascinating one. So I'm gonna, it's my prerogative, although you don't have to comply. <laughs> um, I'm gonna take that question and ask the three of you, if you were conceptualizing a strategy for, 
for African American strategy. I mean, I measured my time in Washington in terms of administrations. That's not the way we should be approaching foreign policy. We need to think much more gener uh, generationally. So if, if each of you had to answer Nama's question, how would you do it? What is it that America can do, maybe with respect to both interests and values, for Africa? And um, Madam President, can I begin with you? What, what can America offer, offer Africa in, in realistic terms? How do we woo the con a continent? Private sector investment. Investment in infrastructure. If we get the railroads and the roads and the electricity to enable us to take our natural resources Add value to them through industries, through factories, through job creating. That would also promote the small and medium sized ones that would link to the large corporate bodies. There hasn't been a lot of investment, private sector investment in Africa. We have relied upon the International Finance Corporation. Uh, of course, the African Development Bank has done its share but we've never had the scale of investment for transformation to be achieved. And so Africa has struggled with that on its own resources. And the alternative sources are just beginning to come. Yes, we have a lot of investment now from other partners uh, in a lot of infrastructure. Uh, we didn't, we wanted the United States to play this role. We wanted them to be the lead partner in areas like that. And so that's my answer to it. And there's a lot of equity, private capital in the United States. It's a question of, can we come up with the instruments that provide the mitigation of the risks that would be involved? And this is where guarantee schemes come in that can be supported by the United States to enable us to have major investment in the private sector. I think that's the missing link. Development aid is no longer part of our agenda. We want to outgrow official development assistance, but we can't do it alone. And we need this big jump to achieve it. Thank you. I mean, it prompts another question as to why uh, the American business community has been reluctant. I mean, there may be structural reasons over the last several decades, but now that Africa is changing and growing, uh, you, you'd have to ask the question why. But let me, let me turn to, uh, to you, uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, on the issue of what can we, how do we woo this continent? It, obviously, it has to be for American interests. It's, there's a reciprocity here and a mutuality, it has to benefit both the United States and, and all of these countries. But how do we do it? How do you respond in, to Nama's fascinating question? And it was a fascinating question. And uh, it really is the question that every single administration policymaker should ask themselves as they approach our future. Uh, relationship with Africa or, or anywhere else in the world. And I think to, to start, we have to start by listening. Uh, you know, you heard me talk about being prescriptive. You mentioned, uh, Naima, um, uh, the feeling that President Obama lectured in, in, in Kenya. Um, uh, we have to get away from that kind of approach to Africa where we are, are kind of on top and we are giving you what we think you need. So I think initially to woo Africa, we have to listen at Africans. Uh, we actually have to have conversations. And again, it may not be with all 54 countries. We may have to prioritize our relationships on the continent and decide that we're gonna focus our attention on making Liberia 
uh, our relationship with Liberia, which has been uh, historically the longest one on the continent of Africa, other countries as the priority countries that we are going to have those discussions with and show by example what it means to have an equal partnership uh, with, a, with a country in Africa where the Africans themselves define with us what the priorities of our relationships uh, with them will be. Uh, I just read a report uh, from Afro Baramana that talks about what Africans uh, want. And uh, one of the things that they listed was that Africans want an understanding of, uh, of their priorities and they want an effective partnership. They want an equal partnership with us. Uh, and, and I think that would be, uh, would be the first step uh, in making, uh, in wooing uh, the continent, uh, but also wooing individual countries. Because again, I think we have to be realistic. We're not going to have an equal partnership with every single country on the continent. So we got to determine what our priorities are uh, in terms of countries, where we have interests and those countries uh, have interests. And our priorities can't be, we're only working with you because we don't want you to work with China. Yeah, uh, We have to understand that there may be some benefits for a country in the relationship with China. And where we might be helpful to that country is to give them the capacity uh, to negotiate uh, better deals uh, with, uh, with other countries like China. Uh, whether it's engineering capacity, it's negotiating capacity, um, it's alternatives uh, to, to those countries. You asked Aaron about why American companies are not more interested in Africa. And I think that's a question that's been asked uh, regularly. And I think it's, it's kind of a two way street. American com companies tend to be very risk averse and countries tend to see companies as somehow not working in their own interest. And this is where I think it's important for countries to have a better sense of what they're negotiating with companies for and a better understanding that companies are there to make money, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean a country can't benefit from uh, a company investing and making money on, on the continent of Africa. The questions they should be asking are, how many jobs are you creating? What, uh, how good are you on paying the taxes that we require you to pay to operate uh, in, in our country? And, uh, and then the, the kind of boogeyman in the room that we're not talking about is the whole issue of corruption. Corruption tends to uh, discourage uh, companies from coming to particular, uh, uh, to particular countries. I'm always asked, is corruption going to be a problem in this country? How do we get around corruption? So, uh, corruption because American companies uh, are clearly uh, restricted uh, for good reason uh, from paying bribes, whereas companies from other countries are not so restricted. So they're able to go around reg some regulatory requirements because they're paying under the table. Uh, American companies won't do that. And rather than uh, deal with the problems that relate to that, they will go and do business elsewhere. Uh, so again, those are issues I think that we need to talk about. I mean, it raises the question of, you know, governing is choosing, essentially. And how do you prioritize with respect to 54 countries, what's vital as opposed to discretionary? Yeah. And your choices, you know, exactly. obviously looking at American policy toward Africa, you could say it's highly secure, securitized, at least in this administration, and perhaps to some degree in the last. You know, we've invested an enormous amount of resources in the deployment of American forces to aid in counterterrorism and insurgency when, in fact, military solutions, frankly, may not be available uh, or not the best way to approach these problems. I'd ask you, Naima, finally to answer your own question, but I, I, which you can do, but I, I'd like to pose one additional question and then take one from the audience because we, unfortunately, due to my technological uh, incapacity, we've wasted a few, a few minutes, not too many. Um, if you had to identify the one thing Americans just don't understand about Africa. What what would it be? Oh, the one God. thing we don't we don't get. Uh, um, well, I think 
that that actually the, the answer to that question is the uh, is actually the same answer to all the other questions. It's the same answer as to why American companies don't invest more in Africa. Um, you know what America needs to do. What Americans don't understand is that we we see you. We see the lack of diversity within your own institutions. We see the lack of diversity within your own companies. And we see the, the racial reckoning that you are having right now. And this expectation that you will come and you will lecture us about equalities, about freedoms when your house is not in order. And, yeah. and the fact that your house is not in order is part of the reason why you, you don't see all the opportunities in Africa. So if there were more people in the State Department Foreign Service that looked like the ambassador or more people in the blue chip companies that looked like us, they would be able to understand. So you, you know, just this issue of corruption, being, a, being an African, being from Sudan, I know how systems work. So in our previous dictatorship, if there had been a direct government to government treaty around increasing investment from American companies, and part of that deal is that there would be no kickbacks for anyone along that line, people would die if there were kickbacks. It is just about political will and understanding the systems that you work in. I would just like to cheekily slightly answer my own question, and this is perhaps a little bit with my journalist hat on. What Africa needs from America is what Africa needs is for America to be what America is at its best. And when America is at its best, it provides a, a, a safe space for the protection of values like freedom of speech, like democratization, like the casting away of corruption. And, and previous American administrations, while we, while we have not loved all of them, they have at least stood for something. And demonstrators have known that when they die in the the streets of an African capital or a capital city, wherever it is in the world, that an American president will stick up for them. That has not been true with this president. This administration was negotiating to normalize talks with President Bashir when he was slaughtering protesters in the streets. And that's what Africa, whether Africa knows it, whether many African leaders will acknowledge it, but what African people need is they need that fail safe that America provides to much of this world. Uh, at least in this superpower cycle. Let's see what happens in another hundred or so years. But for now, America's the best we've got. And you know, uh, I wonder, now is not particularly the best time for America to be showing its wares to the rest of the world. But I, I agree with you. The American experiment is, is the constant search to close the gap. And this is important for, for Africans as well as for everyone else in the international community between the way we are and the way we want to be. And under the right leadership, I mean, that gap may never be closed the, in search of a more perfect union, but it's in search of the more perfect union. The struggle is what's ennobling. And that is what the world, when, when we are respected, I think understands um, about what is, in the, what is the best of America. I mean, we've reached the end of the hour, minus a few minutes. But I, I just want i just want to add one point. Oh, please, but Madam President. Uh, what, Afri what America does not understand about Africa is that we have pride in our race and in our potential to be able to achieve the same amount of progress that other countries and other continents yeah. it's, a, it's a wonderful insight truly and an optimistic one on which to close and I, I can only say that this discussion has reinforced the conviction as to why the launch of a Carnegie Africa program is so compelling and so necessary we barely touched the surface but raised raised some conceptual questions which was my objective here to raise some conceptual questions the bigger questions that are worth worth asking and now carnegie will set uh, to answering them seriously so i want to thank madam president madam ambassador nema thank you so much uh, the richness of this discussion has been really quite remarkable right really quite remarkable I've learned so much and i want to thank you and everyone else for uh, calling in and stay tuned uh, for the next Carnegie Connects uh, session, most likely in September. Thank you all. Stay safe and stay healthy.